Hi there. Um, this is the first of a series of recorded presentations on costume history, uh, periods of costume history. We're going to try this for a little while. And if it works, we'll keep going. If it's not, then we'll just stop. First up, of course, is at the beginning, ancient Egypt. First, a little bit of historical and social context. Um, it is an incredibly long-lived empire, the ancient Egyptian empire, even though it over had several different houses uh, rule it for 3,000 years. 3,000 continuous years it was in power. That's more than us, the United States, more than uh, the British Empire, more than the Roman Empire, uh, just about any empire you can think of. Um, the Ottoman Empire, it wrote even longer. So it's an incredibly long, even though it was a long time ago, it's an incredibly long lived and very static society. Uh, five different periods it is comprised of. First is the Thinite period, which was two smallish kingdoms along the banks of the Mile. Um, they united in the Old Kingdom with first great advances in engineering. Middle Kingdom, not so great, civil so war, anarchy, then reunification and expansion. I believe this is the era of the pyramids of Giza. New Kingdom, the one you usually see in biblical epics and things like that, characterized by a strong central government. And then the Persian domination where the Persians came in for a while and assumed the role of Pharaoh. Then, technically, Egypt's a dynasty ended with the conquest by Alexander the Great. It did go on under Alexander uh, and some Greek um, kingdoms and the Romans for a while as the Ptolemaic Egyptian Empire. So there is that. And of course, uh, the last queen of Egypt before direct Roman occupation was Cleopatra. Women didn't have political power, There's a, but they did run Egyptian household and nurtured children. Um, marriage was a civil contract. Divorce was easy. All you had to say is, I don't want to be married anymore. And if they both agreed, okay, that was it. Move out. Um, Rigid hierarchy, but there's always room for advancement, particularly for educated class like scribes. Hygiene was very important at the time. It was hot. It was humid along the Nile. It is an African, North African country, so hygiene and cleanliness were rigorously applied. There was a low um, incident of disease in the Egyptian empire. Nudity was not a taboo. It was not uncommon for lower classes and children to be completely naked. Uh, among the upper classes, and the scribes, not so much. The more power you had, the more prestige, the more clothes you had on. But, you know, if you're a guy going out to do a blue collar job, you not only have no blue collar, you don't have anything on. And that's just fine. Very big on iconography, uh, which we'll see in some of the clothes. Symbolic jewelry, believed to transfer power to the wearer. The scarab and the hawk, the hawk which represents the sun god Ra, Ra or Re, depending on who you talk to. Cobra of Lower Egypt was a big symbol of Upper Egypt, of the Upper Nile, the vulture, and of course the Eye of Horus symbolized the moon. Sort of the great god looking over. Okay, types of fabric he used. Mostly linen and wool. Cotton unheard of at the time, which is kind of interesting since Egypt, Egypt is a leading cotton producer today. Uh, linen was priced because it was naturally white, and white is sacred. Linens not dyed because they didn't really have a lot of knowledge of the catalyst needed to set the dye in linen. You can dye it. E dyeing linen is easy. It's the color fastness that's a problem. Uh, it was sheer. The thinner the better because it is of the because of the climate. Egyptian weavers could get up to 200 thread count, which at the time was pretty darn good. Spinning wheels haven't been invented yet, so we would use drop spindles, handheld drop spindles. Uh, and a very simple loom, let's see if I could do a highlight here, down here you see this is an Egyptian beam loom. You'd have two of these, you'd tack one on the floor on one part and the other one a little further apart and you would attach your warp threads to that and then your weft thread. So a little bit primitive as you can see. Not unknown, sewing was not unknown even though this is a drapery culture so there's a lot of draping um, but there is some sewing. Linen thread stitched with needle made of copper or fish bone. Scissors haven't been invented yet, so you would cut the cloth with a sharpened piece of flint or tear it. Wool was unclean. It was worn by the lower classes, but not allowed in holy sanctuaries. And we do have some knowledge of tanning, so we have leather, mostly for footwear and some headgear. 
Here is a link to how to use a drop spindle. Um, it's easier to do it this way. I don't know if you can see the, uh, the link there, but it's only about a minute, 20 seconds. If you're interested in how a drop spindle is used, follow this link. Okay, let's talk a little bit about men's clothing. Uh, the shinty is the most basic men's garment. You can see here it's just a skirt wrapped around the waist. That's it. That's basically it. You might have a belt. You see this? This is the spindot. Oh, I'm messing up my picture. Uh, they did have underwear, a triangular loincloth, kind of like a big diaper, um, sometimes usually made of wool, particularly if you were lower classes. But everybody could wear simple triangular loincloth. Nobody's going to see that. So sometimes if you're royalty or a big shot, you will have this triangular starched apron made of wool the only time really you can use it because it will starch but also even though it doesn't say here it is also made of linden linen excuse me and then this thing right here you can see with the arrow point that's a loin pendant there usually decorated if you're a pharaoh you're going to have a tiger's tail that transfers the tiger's power to you also you'll see in the middle kingdom this uh, sort of royal robe called the royal hake which is a piece of sheer linen attached to the back of the neck, but wound around the body and made to look like a shinty or cloak. You can see up here, just kind of wrap around, tuck in right there. And this is all one piece. So it'll, it'll go around the body and come back and tuck in. Let's see if we can find another. Yeah, there's some more variations as you can see. This one here on the uh, right is a two piece, more of a cloak, but this one's all nice and tucked in. Here we see variations in the New Kingdom, where a shinty is longer and fuller and decorated with elaborate spin dots and loin pendants. We no longer have the apron here. And we have these called lectors, these sort of cross-braced, uh, made of leather. <clears throat> Very popular. Here we see a uh, royal or a pharaoh uh, with some upper body cutters. Kind of a hake. You can see this is going to... I'm probably knotted in the back. And then uh, shinty were longer and pleated. You can see. Um, also, this is a sheer pleated linen robe, just to show. Um, usually draping over the fabric. So you see not a lot of fitting. Mostly draping with the spin dot. Bing. And the loin pendant. The pleating was done. Well, I'll show you that later. I'm going to talk about pleating right this minute. Let's look at the women's clothing. The calisiris, a sheath dress, was a very common and characteristic dress for women. Um, sheath of linen seemed on one side closely fitted. It looks like how do you get in that? Well, you can just pull it on. It's linen. Usually fitted um, and held with one or two straps over the bosom. You can see here, remember that nudity is not an issue. So most Thomas style was to have, like you see this one over here, to have it go in between the breasts with this v-strap kind of things or coming off diagonally you can see here there and that band there uh, more coverage if you had a broader bands which is uh, fine uh, it looks it is a natural material linen uh, but you would have some painted patterns or beadwork on it also cut a net of leather or wool or fashion a bead net and layer it over the calisiris that's exactly what this is right here on the left is a bead work or a netting bead net over the calisiris, which is just a white linen. Remember, there's not a lot of dyeing. Dyeing as in color, not like dyeing as in dead. There was some of that too, I'm sure. Uh, common new fashion, kind of like the the one we saw on the Pharaoh, where you take a sheer linen shawl, drape it, and you can see, just kind of wrap it around and knot it in the back, or in this case, in the front. Excuse. Me. Okay, so that's pretty much it. Shinty for men with loin pendants and spin dots. Calisiris for women with a shawl. Um, men shave their heads. Let's go, well, we're going to hairstyles, obviously. Men shave their heads for the purpose of hygiene. Women coiled and plaited theirs into these elaborate cornrows. Our term, not theirs. And then if you're upper class, you're going to put these little precious stones on. You can see right there on the end, which will kind of weigh it down. Um, wigs were very popular. 
So some of these might be women with short hair, and they're just wearing a wig. Uh, beards were good. But, again, Egypt, hot. Men don't wear beards, so you have a wooden one. You can see here, and we'll see better options on this one. This is just a little um, wooden stump that is braided with leather, and then there's hooks that go behind the ears. The lock of youth up in the upper part of the picture there, you can see uh, a symbol of royal status for royal children. So they were shaved, but had that one little lock. Women of all classes, uh, particularly lower classes, but all classes would wear a coat of perfumed beeswax. Remember, um, beekeeping, apiary something, uh, is uh, very was very big in the Egyptian um, empire. In fact, um, when they opened some of the pyramids thousands of years later they found perfectly good honey that was still edible so they're real big into beekeeping and stuff so a cone of perfumed beeswax you put it on the head the cone would melt suffusing the hair or wig with a marvelous honey-like aroma uh, the most characteristic headdress of the egyptian period was the claft extremely easy to make it is just a piece of rectangular f fabric usually wool, that fell into square folds behind the ear and usually knotted or fastened somehow in the back. So you can see that's a very characteristic one. This would become the Nimes. It's the basis for the Nimes headdress, which is very, very characteristic of Keen Tut. Uh, it is, it is um, colorful, striped there. You can see, now this is probably painted and not dye those stripes. So they did have color, but it's not color fast, so it would have to be used again and again. You can see that it had a tail that hanging up, usually some kind of clasp here, and then it hangs down the back. And you can see uh, in this picture, really good uh, representation of the, the clip-on beard, I guess. Uh, some things you should know, uh, the crowns throughout history were adorned on the front with the uraeus very characteristic of the, the Egyptians, which is basically this cobra. That's a uraeus. Sometimes you have a falcon or headdress. You can see here she has a, it looks like a turkey. I think it's a, vul, a vulture. Uh, but the uraeus is the cobra. Um, blue war crown here in the upper one. This symbolizes the ruler's military power of war. And I put this on, this is the one of the best illustrations I can find. You'll see it. This is the, I hope I'm saying this right, this is the Hemhemet crown. Sounds a little bit like a sneeze. Um, a very elaborate, heavy crown. Um, very unwieldy. Use only for ceremonial purposes. Quickly, some accessories. A simple sandals, leather, papyrus. Mostly bare feet. Now here's the thing, because it was footwear, like sandals were not worn outside, outdoors, but carried in hand from place to place. And because your feet are dirty, you put them on once you got inside your destination. <clears throat> so. Jewelry, a little bit about that. Uh, gold, precious, semi-precious stones, lapis lazuli. Uh, both of, we don't have a name for this, is sort of, unless it's a pectoral, we can call it a pectoral. This is why, also characteristic, this wide collar of thin gold inlaid with precious stone uh i'm sorry that's not really a pectoral is it this is well this is more of a pectoral which is a, a necklace this is a form of bead still used to a technique today called fans which is a type of sand glazing and usually has a blue green glaze after fire you see here alternating bands kind of red a different kind of fans in the blue green so these fans beads that we were worn several stands at a time. Uh, a little bit about cosmetics. Face cosmetics, not widely applied, except we do have red ochre, used to color the lips of women. Um, outlining the eyes, this is very characteristic, this eye of Horus look. The coal, which is a mixture of black, mixture of a black mineral called galena, some sulfur and some animal fat to kind of pasty it all up. So that idea of the Egyptian eye, the eye of Horus, also very characteristic there. Uh, and also the crook and flail is very characteristic, carried by a pharaoh or a high um, official. 
symbolizing the two initial kingdoms of Egypt, representing the two main economies of the region. The crook represents sheep herding, and the flail represents wheat production. So a symbol of authority. Specialty costumes, uh, priests wore nothing really different. They wore uh, usually a long shinty, maybe a cloth of fabric folded. A leopard skin was highly prized by religious orders, um, a symbol of religious power. Um, sandals are the same. No wool or leather, very unclean, forbidden. And priests must either shave or pluck all hair from their body. All hair from their body. Military, there's not much on it. It's hot. It's still hot. So there you wore mainly a short shinty like these soldiers here in this funerary display. A little bit of claft, which this man down here has my book. And then usually a shield, a triangular shield, and then they'd have a spear or either a little war club to bat people on the heads with. But there's not really a lot of armor going on there. And the lower classes, like I said, wore very little. Here we see some musicians with the perfume beeswax. Uh, she's wearing just a little thong thing. They have very sheer uh, pleated calisiruses, calisiri. Um, and they had one or two wigs made of wool, or they would cornrow their, sh their hair. Uh, but that's it. And then a lower class man. Here you see a woman in a calisiris and a man in a shinty with a um, pendant. Looks like a fisherman and maybe his bride, his wife. So that was um, pretty much it. Some quick examples just through history, like uh, since this is a costume, theatrical costume class of how this period looks um, when uh, portrayed on stage and screen. Of course, the most famous example is Cleopatra. Uh, here we see some, some terracotta image. We don't really know what she looked like. This coin may be her, so she may not be the great, great beauty that people were talking about, but she did have great charisma. Mostly today, from particularly starting the 19th century, uh, she's she's uh, portrayed very sensuously, very sexually provocative. Like in this Calisiris here, she's got a, a what is that, a leopard at her feet, and you can see her her handmaiden or her lady in waiting or whatever is is kind of pulled her Calisiris all the way down, and she's got kind of the you know quintessential look there with the, all that color and everything testing poisons on the condemned prisoners. Here's another, the death of Cleopatra, where, why is this in a costume class? She's not wearing anything. She's got the Uraeus headdress, again, very characteristic there. And then through the ages, lots of, lots of adaptations of Cleopatra. Here's an engraving from Sh Bernard Shaw's Cleopatra. You can see there where she was snuggled, smuggled into Caesar's quarters in a rug. From 1891, the great Sarah Bernhardt an overwrought uh, sort of um, Gilded Age costume in the Shakespeare version. Constant Collier, a great actress of the day, playing Cleopatra, Shakespeare. Theta Bera, uh, the vamp, the word the vamp, or the term for a woman, a vamp, came with Theta Bera. You can see it's 1917. This is a film where she was Cleopatra dancing for Julius Caesar. And you can see before the Hayes Code, a little bit of something something going on there and not what you uh, would associate with a silent movie and of course not very period at all caught at colbert in a classic um version in 1934 an art deco dream as you can see has maybe the uraeus headdress but that's about it the entire set and costume budget was um inspired by art deco not at all accurate but incredibly gorgeous Vivian Lee did a version in 1945. Elizabeth Taylor, of course, in one of the most famous bombs of all time um, with very odd kind of polyester. But probably here's a Hammett uh, headdress, something close to it. Probably wouldn't show as much. They would have this low decolletage in, uh, in Egypt, obviously. And then there's a couple of there's a stage version was Francis de la Tour, which is kind of deconstructed and Leonor Varela. It was a miniseries in 1999. Um, also, uh, Gal Gadot's going to play Cleopatra next, I think. She's slated to be in a movie. Uh, Aida, an opera about um, Egypt. The Mummy Returns, I put here because it had a flash. Obviously, it's Egypt. These women wearing these sheer shinty. 
Uh, I don't think these Japanese sword catchings were there, but uh, it's a pretty good representation of some parts of Egypt. There's an Australian miniseries called Tut. And then, of course, there's a movie sometime about five or six years ago, which was, it was some film, but it was kind of overdone, overwrought. Some nice bits, though. He's, he's got a really nice military getup, all gold. The woman on the right, I'm not sure what she is, but that, that dress is probably pretty close to period, more so than you think. Not the brassiere. The thing about when you see women in these halter tops, these bikini type or bra type halter tops is they, bras didn't come around till the end of the 19th century. So you're probably not going to see a lot of those in real life. Um, John Galliano for House of Dior in 2004 had a Egyptian inspired show you see here. Um, some more of that. So this is Okator. This is really not obviously something you would buy. And they kind of did that really funny walk like an Egyptian thing. And then I'm not sure how she saw, but it was kind of an interesting.